Flower, thank you very much for joining us. And I'm going to turn it over to you. OK, great. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Buenos dias. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, I'm going to jump right in because I have a lot to share with you. And I think it's a really important and timely topic uh, that I think we all need to hear. I'm talking to myself as much as I'll be talking to you. Um, as we have generally done before, my typical practice is to make a deliberate effort to maintain strong eye contact. That is a nonverbal immediacy cue that can reduce the distance that you can also practice if you're teaching by video, whether live or recorded. And so I keep an eye on, on the camera, except when I ask you for input in the chat box or using emojis, those kinds of things. And so when that happens, I will turn my attention off the camera and uh, look at the appropriate window. But as I mentioned just right before we got started, if there's anything that needs attention during the presentation, do um, maybe Susan or Kathy feel free to unmute and kind of just call that out to me because I, I generally miss things that might be happening in the chat box otherwise, although it is an intentional decision. So <laughs> there's always a method to my madness most of the time anyway. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, we're here today to talk about wired for connection. And I was reviewing my notes. Um, you know, this is, if I'm not mistaken, this is my fourth appearance here at University of Incarnate Word. And it's such a joy to me to, to have this opportunity with you, this repeated opportunity. Um, but I noticed again that our first talk, which was in January, was on fostering connections and community. And I was reflecting myself a little bit today about I think connection is really important to me right now because I made a whole new talk about it. Uh, this has been developed just in the last month or so. And the reason is, is I think that we are all feeling very disconnected as a result of our pandemic experience. And this is a primary contributor to what we are experiencing in terms of our own fatigue and disengagement and our students' disengagement and disconnect. There have been multiple stories in the Chronicle of Higher Ed in the last few weeks. There's one out today in the teaching newsletter about how we can overcome student disengagement. Well, I am 100% convinced that what I'm going to share with you today is a, is a key approach to help us collectively overcome our own and help our students overcome their disengagement as well. And really the founding kind of thesis, the, the main point here is that we really are wired for connection. Our brains are wired for connection. This is how we were made. This is how we were designed. And this lack of this kinds of uh, spontaneous social connections is taking a significant toll on our mental well-being collectively, again, as a society, not just, um, you know, in teaching and learning contexts. We're seeing reports of increased traffic deaths as one example, because people are driving much more aggressively I believe as a society, we have lost a lot of civility and what's missing, the missing piece is connecting with other people. So that's where we're gonna go today. Uh, I typically have a little slide that kind of introduces myself, but I'm skipping that today. Um, however, I will share one little piece of information as we were chatting about um, prior to the session. And the reason I'm sharing this piece of information is because it's really helpful to help our students see us as real people. So I was uh, chatting a few minutes ago about getting ready for a big move to Missouri. I've been in Arizona for my whole entire life in the same professional, professional context for my whole career. So super exciting, but also really overwhelming. And, um, you know, so now you know a little bit more about me beyond uh, my soon to be dismantled Zoom box. We're going to be packing up here pretty soon. <laughs> so as I like to do, I have a question for you and I'll invite you to choose an emoji to answer this question. Um, my question is, what does it feel like when you're part of the group? How does that feel when you feel like you're a part of the group? You can put an emoji, it, it will show up in your Zoom window. Thank you, I see a thumbs up. You can also put that in the chat box, whichever um, you like to do. How does it feel when you're part of the group? Yes. I see that little emoji reminds me of hugs. I see some feeling loved emojis, some big smiles. Um, yeah, it feels good, right? It actually, we experience um, a dopamine hit, uh, you know, when we have those positive experiences. Yes, I see some love eyes, some okays. Um, yeah, and thank you also, uh, Dr. Moon, for introducing yourself there. Yes, good, awesome. So feeling part of the group is a really, really good feeling. Thank you, Evelyn, as well. But let me ask you this. What does it feel like when you aren't? When you don't feel like you're a part of the group, what does that feel like? 
I see some more love icons and I'm going to assume that's for the first question, not the second one. What does it feel like when you don't feel part of the group, when you feel excluded? Yeah, Terrence, thank you. Kind of crazy, okay. <laughs> Sad, mad, yes, Maria, thank you so much. It does make us feel mad. It, it makes us feel bad. Um, lots, of, lots of negative emojis being um, shared here. It doesn't feel good at all when we feel like we're not part of the group. And this is where we're gonna really focus today is helping our students feel like they are in fact part of our group, that they are welcome at the University of Incarnate Word, that this is their place and we are their people because this is how we're going to help them. In jargon terms, this is sense of belonging. If you've heard of that phrase, I'll be honest, that phrase doesn't really resonate with me. It, it, it's, it feels too jargony to me. So we're gonna talk about helping our students know that they are in the right place at the right time, which is a theme that really does pervade my work. But again, to kind of set the stage for where we're going, I really think that we should reflect on the disruption that we have experienced in the last two years. If we didn't pause and reflect on this from time to time, we aren't able to engage in healing practices for ourselves and help our students do the same. We have never seen anything like what we've been through in the last two years. And we ourselves, our own ability to engage cognitively is um, unlike anything we've ever experienced before. Trauma and anxiety 100% take a toll on our cognitive capacity. Pandemic brain is really a thing. And I fully believe that we are still dealing with that. It didn't just go away. And as I also mentioned before uh, we got started, I think we're tired. I think we are so tired. I did give this talk, I haven't given it many times, but I gave it once in Missouri. Um, it's my new home state, the show me state. And um, I was just reviewing my slides as I always do on the plane, just kind of helped me um, kind of refresh and practice and rehearse. And there was a guy sitting across the aisle in one seat behind me and he saw this, he leaned over and tapped me on the shoulder. He said, I don't actually know what talk you're giving, but I really like that slide. <laughs> I just, we're, we are tired. And I think as academics, we don't um, admit that to ourselves. We don't allow ourselves to recognize that we are fatigued. And I'm basing this sense, my perception of this on lots of conversations with literally hundreds and thousands of faculty members all across the country, because this is my work that I have the privilege of doing right now. I meet with faculty all the time and collectively we are exhausted. Burnout was a long time ago. So as we think about how can we get, come out of this season, this is more of a theoretical, a hypothetical question. What can we do to support both our students and ourselves? We have to put on our own oxygen mask before we can help our students get theirs on. And so I have lots of ideas today. And they're really um, shaped by an article that I'll tell you about in a minute. The, um, the author is, um, sorry, I'm gonna admit to having pandemic brain and moving brain. Let me focus, okay, we're here. Uh, this is Adam Grant who wrote this article. He's a sort of an organizational psychologist well-known and he wrote a piece that really got my attention a number of months back. Oops, there he is. This is the article um, about how we're gonna come back out of this pandemic. And he talks about collective effervescence. My slides are a little bit out of order, so forgive me. Collective effervescence, Adam writes in this piece is the synchrony that we feel. The opportunity to connect with other people and feel synergized synergized? I think I just made that word up. Energized by the synergy that we experience with people. Now, I observed this. I was reviewing these slides on the plane to Missouri, and I observed this happen right in, front of, uh, right in the row in front of me. Uh, we were two-thirds of the way through the flight, and suddenly there was a married couple, a retired couple, and an, uh, another woman sitting in that row of three, and suddenly they realized that she is a loan officer. That single woman is a loan officer at the same bank that the married man worked at for 40 years, literally the same office. And uh, so all of a sudden they were like, wow, I can't believe it, what a small world. And he would say, hey, do you remember Bev? And she would say, yeah, she was always such an awesome dresser. She retired you know, a few years ago. And he would say, do you remember Paula? And she's like, yeah, she's going to retire. She's, she's still there. And I just, I was like, look, that is collective effervescence. Now they didn't do that for the whole rest of the flight. It might've been a little bit annoying, but they had a few minutes where they were just literally buzzing. You could almost see it right in the air around them. And that is exactly what we are missing. And that is what we need to recapture. Uh, Grant writes about the fact that in um, communities that are uh, geared to pursuing happiness socially, that we experience more well-being, again, mental and emotional well-being, 
as opposed to communities like the mainstream United States. I don't say we all do this, but in America, there's definitely a sense of pursuing happiness individually. And in those societies, he argues, we actually increased, um, we see increased loneliness, depression, and other kind of mental health challenges. So let's look today at how we can pursue happiness socially in our professional lives. I'll encourage you to think about how you can apply these concepts in your, in your personal lives as well. And what Grant explains is that the way we do this is by connecting with people, by caring about people and contributing, making a meaningful contribution. And really what this has led me to conclude as has been recently coined by the author Susan Rock is that we are not brains on sticks. She has this phrase relating to our students that they are not brains on sticks. They are whole people. They need to be attended to holistically. And I've taken her concept and extended it just a little bit. Neither are we. We're not brains on sticks either. We are whole people. And I would argue that we're kind of hurting. We're kind of hurting. And we need to attend to our well-being so that we can help our students. Now, as usual, I like to highlight the work of the scholars who I am drawing on here. Um, so Harriet Schwartz is the author of a book called Connected Teaching. In April 2020, she wrote a blog that was right after the Pivot Online. She wrote a blog post about authentic teaching in an online, or sorry, authentic connecting in an online world. And this phrase has resonated with me ever since. She wrote, what our students want to know. In her piece, it was about um, online teaching and learning, but this is relevant for our in-person classes too. She said, here's what our students want to know. I see you, I care, you matter. Students frequently say they just feel like a number, even, even in classes that aren't giant, the, the system, the university, they feel like a number, not like a person. And what we know is that relationships are really a key part of teaching and learning, but I don't think that in higher ed, we really focus on this enough. I would say this is better known in K-12. Here in higher ed, we're appropriately focused on our disciplinary expertise and helping our students learn what they need to. But this book, a Relationship Rich Education, I would highly recommend it for another summer reading opportunity, um, really focuses on the critical importance of relationships on campus. I'm gonna to focus today on what happens in our classes, but they also write about even relationships with advisors, of course, with financial aid folks, even with the groundskeepers and the people who are getting your coffee for you, relationships are the key defining element of success. I'm also drawing on the work of Lisa Nunn, author of College Belonging. She uh, cites abundant research that uh, shows that feeling a sense of belonging predicts academic achievement and success. And again, the work of Brian Dewsbury, another scholar who I deeply respect and admire, that he argues, again, cites research that belongingness predicts success more than a student's GPA or more than their SAT scores in the first two years of college. If they feel like they belong on campus, if they feel like this is their place and we are their people, they are more likely to be successful in earning their degree. But he also talks about how students might feel uh, like they don't belong. I'm thinking about first generation students. I am thinking about um, students of color. Higher ed was not designed as a system. It was not designed for students of color. It was designed for elite white men. And so our students come to the structures that show them that they don't belong. And they already have that nagging feeling in the back of their mind. And then when they see cues, um, that tell them, that reinforce that, it confirms what they believe and they stop out or they don't complete their, their college. Now, a lot of schools are doing a lot, a lot of campuses are doing a lot to communicate you belong. But my focus today is what are we doing in our own classes? And I was actually in Texas last week. I was in San Antonio at UTSA and what a beautiful green place. That was a good reminder to me that not all of Texas looks like uh, the desert. And my Lyft driver, his name is Alejandro. I'm going to tell you something that he shared with me. And I asked him, I said, can I tell your story? And he said, yes. So I, we were, he was very chatty. Some Lyft drivers are not. Alejandro was telling me that he, this is all he does. This is his full-time gig is to drive for Lyft. And he loves it, but sometimes he works seven days a week or sometimes 10 hours a day, depending on what he's saving up for or needing to pay for. And he asked me what I do. So I told him I was at UTSA working with faculty and helping them figure out how we can better support our students. And it was really kind of a heartbreaking story because he is from Mexico, he has a strong accent. There is research to show that when people are speaking a second language with a strong accent, that the 
um, perceptions of their intelligence go down. He was a very, very smart guy, very insightful, very perceptive. And he said, I remember when I was in college and I would go to class and my professor would be, would be like this. Don't you get it? And he stopped, he dropped. Now he's a very, very intelligent, resourceful man driving Lyft for a living. And I said, this is why I do what I do. And he said, good, keep doing it. So I, I really think it's important to help our students know that they belong. And we're gonna talk about um, a few different ways that we can do that today because connectedness 100% boosts learning. It's not just about social interactions and isn't that nice and warm and fuzzy, no. Again, feeling connected promotes academic achievement and learning and allows our students to relax and engage cognitively. Remember at the beginning, I asked you a question. What does it feel like you when you feel like you're part of the group and you're in the right place? What does it feel like when you don't? Uh, we know that when we feel like we don't belong, we experience anxiety, feelings of being threatened, fear, and all of those negative emotions shut down learning. They hinder our ability to learn. So if we actively work to help our students do feel like they're part of the group, that they're welcome, that they're included, that they're valued in our classes, it's going to relax everything. They will be in an alert state of mind and ready to engage cognitively. It will help them process and learn. So today we're going to look at strategies to promote both social belonging, where I feel like this is my campus, this is as a person, I feel like I'm in the right place. But we're also going to focus today on strategies that promote academic belonging. So that if I am Alejandro and I am in your class and I feel like maybe I'm not cut out for college, then I drop, right? So we're going to talk about ways that we can help Alejandros, our Alejandros know that they are in the right place and they can do this. So, you know, with the appropriate effort and work, we don't reduce our rigor, but we do communicate to our students that it's hard work, but they can do it and they belong here. They are cut out for college. We're also going to focus first, though, on how we can support our own well-being. Because as I said a minute ago, we cannot support our students if we ourselves are feeling drained and exhausted. And we are. So I'm just going to take a few minutes here at the beginning to um, remind us maybe of things we already know, but sometimes it's good to be reminded um, to, to take care of ourselves. Because again, I think in academia, I don't think, I know it, we have a culture of overwork and we ourselves tend to be high achieving individuals who don't allow ourselves the opportunity to take care of ourselves the way we really need to. So I'm gonna stop right now and do something that feels a little awkward in Zoom, but I'm gonna do it anyway. And I'll invite you to join me if you like. Here's a strategy that I have found to be very useful because it's very simple. So you can see the instructions on the screen. I'm gonna stop talking. I find that in the craziness of the day-to-day, -day, that if I can remember to do this three times, five times, it really helps me reset, refocus, and come back to the task with a clearer mind. So I would encourage you to um, think about ways that you can take care of yourselves. And I'm gonna ask you right now, if you would like to share in the chat box, because I am always learning from you. And uh, if you want to type in Spanish, Evelyn has agreed to uh, transcribe your comments in English so that I can read them. Um, what is something that you've been doing? Uh, maybe you want to start doing to support your own well-being. Something that you used to do and you want to resume. Yoga, yes, absolutely. Quality sleep, ooh, that's a good one. Love it. Exercise. Gardening, hands in the dirt, oh, I love it. Play the violin. I'm gonna look for the translations of the Spanish. I should probably just have Google Translate open. I'm sorry. Honestly, I feel a little um, regretful that I don't speak Spanish. So thank you for putting up with me. To eat well, to take power naps. The front porch swing with a cigar, oh, I love it. Uh, walking, positivity at the very beginning of the day, lifting weights, yay, practicing Spanish on Duolingo. That's something that I can do too, thank you. Um, hiking the Arizona mountains, very good. Okay, so Evelyn is gonna translate a few things, walking outside, good, uh, playing piano. These are all good things. Do you know what I have rediscovered is jigsaw puzzles. 
because I find that I want to do something with my hands. And so really after a webinar like this, it is um, very tiring for me. So I will take a 15 or 20 minute break and I will do something not with a screen and not with uh, my brain. Jigsaw puzzles are a way that I can do that. And another thing I've rediscovered and am enjoying is playing solitaire with a pack of physical cards. I am so tired of screens and devices and something kind of more manual I have found to be uh, very helpful. Listening to fountains, walking, a glass of plain water, um, even brief exercise, meditation, and sleep. Bare feet on the ground, yes. Minus the, the uh, pests, good. Weaving, wonderful, thank you. So I just wanted to invite us to take a minute to remind ourselves of the value and, and the importance of these things. Um, walking, riding, maybe riding your horse, um, talking with family and friends, again, because that's connecting. Wordle is providing some, um, some benefits for ourselves. I really don't think that we give ourselves permission to do enough of these things. I was literally talking with my husband this morning. As I mentioned before, we're getting ready to go to Missouri. Um, we've never lived in a state with green rolling lawns because Arizona, that's hard to do. And he was saying he's going to be retired, which is awesome for him. He was saying, should I um, get a rider mower, like a ride on mower and mow the lawn myself? Or should we get a lawn service? He's got terrible allergies to grass. And he was like, you know what? I don't like mowing the lawn. I'm going to get a service. <laughs> and so that's what I mean. I don't think we give ourselves permission to um, recognize what brings us joy and what doesn't and um, take more time doing the things that we enjoy doing. So I have a couple of other very sort of practical teaching oriented recommendations to share with you on this topic. So let's go forward. Really important to both define and protect our boundaries. I'm thinking specifically with our students, but of course this applies in other contexts. Um, you know, our students, and we all are as a society, are pretty accustomed to instant gratification where we get an auto um, chatbot response to a quick question. We're very used to a quick response and our students are too, but they need to respect our humanity. I would argue we need to respect our humanity. So I would encourage you in your syllabus and in messaging throughout the semester, tell your students, I'm not online on Sundays. That is for my family. My eyes need a break from the screen. Okay, that's what I tell my students. And then I go out and I pull weeds, which I find oddly therapeutic, um, right? So communicate to your students um, and then really do your best. This is a journey. Uh, it doesn't mean that we do this perfectly all the time. Sometimes I am grading on a Sunday but uh, really do your best to protect those boundaries that you, that you experience or that you set. And a big part of that too is to communicate your availability to your students. For the first time ever this spring, I have just now started sharing my own personal cell phone number with my students. I had a lot of trips this, this spring, partly with a job search, partly with uh, travel and in-person events resuming. And I went ahead, I'm, I'm teaching an online class right now. And I told them, hey, I'm gonna be in and out of email contact, but if you really need something urgently, just shoot me a quick text. Now that was a decision that I made and it hasn't bitten, you know, it hasn't gone bad. They, I actually haven't heard from any of my students on my cell phone, but um, it's really a good idea to communicate what's happening so that your students recognize that you're a person too, because that really is a key thing. A couple of weeks ago, one of my daughters, I have three daughters, if you don't remember that from previous introductions and my slide, my getting to know you slide. One of my daughters had a really big uh, challenge with her chronic illness. We were right on the brink of going to the emergency room at two o'clock in the morning. Um, it was, a, it was a, an episode that lasted for a few days and it really just threw off my groove. I just got behind on everything because it was draining and it required my full attention and it was demanding and it was exhausting. And I finally, I just sent my online students an announcement saying, hey, I'm a little behind on your grading. I am really sorry, this is what's happening. Now I have been teaching long enough and I'm a very open person. So I felt comfortable. I didn't go into details just like I didn't with you here because they're not important. What's important is telling your students if you are unexpectedly unavailable or um, you know, keeping them in the loop. If you're gonna, if you're a little behind on grading, but I have a plan, I'll be caught up by next week. Any of that kind of communication, depending, I mean, and then you decide how much you want to share or not. There's been other times that I've been much more sort of um, closed about what I share my students, but I do communicate when I'm available, if I'm behind, when I'm gonna get back uh, up to speed and such. And doing this is a wellness strategy because then it gives you permission to set aside the grading and to go out for that walk and to sit on the porch with your cigar and to go for that horseback ride and to do your yoga and to get out into the garden. When you define your boundaries and then communicate to your students, it gives you that permission that we're all kind of looking for. 
Now I have two more radical suggestions to share with you on this topic and then we're gonna move forward. First of all, I had to read a book to learn how to rest. <laughs> it's a great book, I highly recommend it. And I fully appreciate the irony that I had to read a book to learn how to rest, but I literally did not know how. And again, I didn't give myself permission. So in this book, uh, Sujong Kim Peng argues that we, uh, we are more productive, cognitively speaking, and we are more creative when we allow our brains to rest. So please give yourselves permission to do that yoga. That's exactly the kind of thing that he's talking about. He cites all kinds of historical examples of highly prolific people like Charles Dickens and Charles Darwin for two examples, who only worked for two, three hours a day. And then they spent the whole rest of the day out on walks or playing tennis or painting or playing a musical instrument. Um, so really encouraging us to remember that we can actually be more productive if we carve out and define time to rest. And you may be thinking, okay, well, that's all well and good, but how am I gonna do this? I'll share one other crazy recommendation with you, and that is to subtract. Let's think about what we can take away from our lives. This book is based on uh, research that shows that as a species, we are very additive. If there's a problem to be solved, we, keep, we wanna keep on adding things onto it. But this research shows, even with something as simple as a Lego problem, the Legos, that when the researchers coach participants to try taking away some Legos, that they actually come up with simpler and more elegant solutions. And so this is where I'm going to invite us to think a little bit about, is there something that we can stop doing in our personal lives, in our professional lives? Based on this recommendation, um, I made a big change. I've been teaching the class. It's an online graduate level class. And I actually took out all of the paper assignments in that class and I replaced all of them with asynchronous video uh, discussions using a tool called Flipgrid. Some of you may have heard of it or have been using it. Um, and in the class that I teach, by the way, before you go, you took out all the papers. The class is on technological fluency. It's on um, using tech well. And I was like, I don't think that writing a five page paper is necessary to show me that you're developing technological fluency. I would rather have you talk about it. I would rather get you more comfortable in front of a camera because it is the way of tomorrow's workplace. And so um, it was a, the writing, the papers were a writing burden for my students. They were a grading burden for me. I took them out. And now I spend all of my teaching and grading time talking with my students. So just something to think about. You know, I know we have limitations and curriculum committees and accreditation standards and all that. I do, I know that. But let's think about if there's something we can take away. Maybe there's a committee that we can get out of. Maybe there is a chore that we can um, hire a service to come in and do. Um, let's think about how we can subtract in order to protect our well being. And why do we want to do this? Because it will give us more ability to connect with and relate with the people in our classes and help them be successful. So I'm gonna pause again here and then we'll move into some really practical strategies. Thoughts and questions at this time. Um, I don't know how many, we're, we're not a huge group. If anybody wants to unmute, um, maybe you can raise your Zoom hand. If you would prefer to uh, type into the chat box, we'll do it that way with Evelyn kindly translating anything that comes in in Spanish. What's on your mind? I'm actually gonna pull the slides down and I'll tell you why. Because the slides themselves are a barrier. And we also know that staring at slides in Zoom increases the eye strain we already experience when we're in Zoom. And so if you are teaching uh, in an online synchronous way like this, maybe look for ways and times that you can pull down your slides as well. I haven't seen anything coming in yet. Thoughts, questions? or maybe quiet reflection, that's okay too. I'll give this just a minute in case anything's coming in on the chat box, but then we'll go ahead and resume if, if our <laughs> you brain. don't mind. Flower, I thought I'd say something. Um, yes. In the genre of subtracting, but it, it seemed I actually gained. One of the things that drains my time, my energy, um, and doesn't facilitate the best relationships with students 
is the exam review in my office when they haven't done well. And this is a pre-licensure nursing program. So the answers are very, they're not nebulous. They're, it's very much content related to hard science. And there's always, you know, there's a lot of arguing. And, but I thought this and I thought that. I decided, I took it, took it by the horns and instead I now provide, I go through the exam, I make a recording and I talk to the students. Every single one of them can see it. And I say, this is why this is the answer to this question. This is what we were trying to understand about this question. We needed to know if you understand this and they all get it. And you know what? Yeah, I do a different exam next semester. I'm not worried about other students getting a hold of the exam content because it has been so fruitful for me to tell everyone this is what the thinking is. It's just been the best decision I ever made. Cindy, I love that example. And you said a key point um, when you said everybody now can benefit from it, right? Not just the ones who come to see you in your office. And it's a perfect example of investing a little time. It took you some time to do that, but the payoff is so worth it. And I find that principle applies to things like rubrics. You know, um, I, I had a, a mentor, you heard this phrase too, pay it for, not pay it forward, pay me now or pay me later. Like doing a little bit of work up front can actually save you a ton of time. So Cindy, I love that. Thank you so much. Um, I do see another question and thank you. Yes, proactive for sure. Thank you to Evelyn for translating that for me. I will bring the slides back up and um, give you an opportunity to make a note of these uh, book titles if you would like to. And I will also tell you that I listened to both of these on audiobook. That's how I be productive. And I, I listen to them after I drop off my daughters at school and drive back home or if I'm running errands. This is a solution that buys me a little bit more time. So the first one is called Rest. And uh, he talks about the value of mind wandering and our default mode network. And um, so, yeah, so those are some little teasers that you can get the book and learn more about. And this one is called Subtract. Uh, to be fair, this person, oh, awesome. Thank you, Evelyn. Um, this book, I, I think you might not need to listen to all of it. It's a, actually, uh, it has received some criticism that maybe the author should have subtracted a little bit of the writing. <laughs> but I, I, it has a lot of stories. And if that resonates with you, that might be good. And if not, you might be able to um, read part of the book and still get the same kind of idea. So wonderful. Again, thank you, um, Evelyn and Robert. Absolutely, we have to do what we have to do. So please. Okay. And another comment coming in, uh, group exams after the individual exam. Um, yes, I love this suggestion that students can get the correct exam and then that reduces the number who need an exam review afterward. Absolutely. Um, some, you might've heard these called pyramid exams or, um, yeah, basically an individual effort and then a collective effort as well. So awesome. And I do, I actually do know gracias. Thank you so much, Evelyn. <laughs> Thank you. You'd think living in Arizona that I would have picked up more Spanish in my life, but maybe it's time for Duolingo, right, Nicole? Okay, we are going to focus now on um, what we can do to help our students feel like they are real people and that we see them as real people and we value and respect them because this is the foundation. If this is not the case, our students won't be able to learn. And then we're gonna turn our attention to how we can help them experience academic belonging and we will have a little bit of time for questions and conversation at the end as well. So please do be um, thinking about your questions, but also please follow Cindy's awesome example. And also, is it, I don't wanna mispronounce your name, I'm sorry, last name Coker, um, Adiola. I'm not sure if I'm saying that correctly. Close, okay. Adiola, um, yes, you're close. Adiola, thank you so much. Um, please follow these great examples. Hi, so nice to see you. Um, Follow these great examples and share with your colleagues here changes that you have made that are supporting your own well-being when it comes to your to your classes, because that is the benefit, that is the collective effervescence that we are experiencing right here in this moment is the opportunity to learn from all of you. So when it comes time to questions and conversation, please take me up on my invitation to either unmute or type into the chat box and um, share some of the things that are supporting uh, your own well-being and your students too. Okay, 
how can we help our students know that we see them and that we, um, you know, know that they are real people? Well, you will have heard a similar recommendation from me if you have watched any of my other or attended any of my other presentations. And the reason I keep on reiterating this is, again, I think in higher ed in particular, we, and also culturally speaking, in some cultures, the professor really is the authority. And that's okay. I'm not saying to go against your cultural values, however, and your, your cultural context. However, I think that as um, instructors, as professors, we could go a little bit further than we might already uh, be accustomed to doing to help our students see us as real people. When they see us as real people with flaws, with joys, with passions, with bad days. Sometimes we have bad days. And if our students see that about us, it helps them to feel like we're going to be empathetic if they need some extra support. I think one major lesson during this pandemic is that uh, unexpected things happen, <laughs> crises come up, emergencies come up, and our students are asking us to retain some of the flexibility and the empathy that we began implementing during the pandemic. When we are willing to be a little more transparent and vulnerable with our students within our own personal and professional boundaries, don't do anything that makes you feel uncomfortable, but maybe see if there's a step that you can take to help your students get to know you more so that they then know and can relax cognitively that when they know that, um, that you are an, a real person too. I'm not sure if my mouse was being really annoying right then. Sorry, I was trying to move a window so that I could see all of your win faces. And also, if you don't have your camera on, that's okay. It's all right, I get it. Um, but when you do have your camera on, I wanna see your faces. So um, helping your students get to know you, there are so many ways that you can do this. If you have been in my other presentations, you probably saw my slide that has pictures of my family. I talk about them a little bit. Uh, you can have an all about me video. There's a really great tool called Animoto, A-N-I-M-O-T-O, -O, that makes it super easy to upload some pictures and then you choose a music theme of one of their pre-existing and you can make like a two minute quick video, slideshow, movie uh, that helps your students see you, um, hobbies, favorite travel destinations, pets, anything like that. Um, and then you'll also notice you know, in terms of my own personal style and my comfort level, I talk to you pretty openly about stuff that's happening in my life. Like I'm about to move across the country with three teenagers and two cats. And so <laughs> being willing to share details about your life within that comfort zone um, is just an important way to help uh, your students feel that they are in the right place and that they're your people, right? We need to show our students that there are people. And so being a little bit real with them don't do anything that feels weird or unsafe, but um, being real with them is an important thing to remind ourselves to do. But equally important is to make a little effort to get to know our students. Now, I know this can be challenging, especially if we're teaching large enrollment classes or if we're burdened with our own professional responsibilities. But this is a really important way to advance equity. One of the talks that I gave was on advancing equity and inclusion in our classes. And one of the most important strategies that is recommended by experts in this area is to overcome or mitigate biases, implicit biases, by seeing the people in front of us as individuals and not by relying on unintended or even unconscious assumptions that we might be making when we look at students. So taking a little bit of an effort to get to know who is in front of us really does make a difference and helps our students feel seen. Remember Harriet Schwartz's quote, I see you. Our students want to feel seen. A few different ways that you can do this. I really love the idea of a supportive survey. And I call it that because you can uh, send this out in Canvas, for example. It can be just kind of a quick um, survey or ungraded quiz type of a thing. Do it at the beginning of the semester. Ask your students maybe some academic things. What's your major? Um, what are your career aspirations? Where are you in your program? When do you think you'll graduate? You can ask them some of those things. That's good but then you can add some values affirmation into the survey as well. And you can uh, communicate to your students, actually they'll be communicating to themselves that they are cut out for this. So you can tell them, you can ask them, what is one accomplishment that you're really proud of? And when students articulate that about themselves, it helps them to gain the confidence that they can do this. Uh, you can ask them, what are some of your strengths? Again, it helps the students kind of affirm to themselves that it's important. Now. Uh, this is one way that you can do this. If you teach a larger enrollment class, uh, I recommend that you take a sampling 
of the surveys. You don't have to read every single one of them, but take a random sampling of the surveys and get to know kind of a little bit about the group. And then if a student is going to come and see you for an exam review or um, another opportunity, a meeting, you could actually pull up that student. You could even do it right there while they're with you, um, even in Zoom, for example, sharing screens. And you can kind of talk through or preview what that individual student shared about themselves. So I really love this idea of supportive surveys. Of course, small talk before and after class. Of course, chatting in the hallway or on the pedway on campus. Of course, visiting small groups and chatting with people, you know, your students, whether it's breakout groups or going around the room and talking with them. Anything that we can do to extend belonging to our students is really going to help them engage cognitively. And let me pause and actually unpack what I just said a minute ago about extending belonging. This comes from that book that I mentioned, Lisa Nunn, her book, College Belonging. She writes about uh, a 19th century sociologist named Emil Durkheim. With apologies to any sociologists here in the room, I am not one, but um, so I'm not going to pretend to be an expert. But what I will say is that he had this concept that the group has to extend belonging to the individual. You can't just show up and say, okay, I'm a part of the group, that the group has to extend that belonging. And this is what I'm talking about. How are we doing this in our classes? How are we extending belonging to our students so that they know that they are part of the group? And I was kind of joking, I think before we got started that I do feel part of the group now at UIW, that um, I've been with you a few times and I love that it's such a joy and a privilege because most of my work is dropping into, you know, a bunch of faculty, a, a collective, sorry, a pandemic brain, uh, moving brain. Most of my work is to be with a group of faculty for an hour and then, and then I leave. This is actually what caused me to seek another campus-based role is that I, I love the opportunity to have those longer term relationships. But um, I feel that you have extended belonging to me. I feel pretty comfortable with you, which is why I'm being a little more authentic and um, being a little more real with you than when I'm very professional. Um, so think about ways of making time, that's the real thing, make time to get to know your students a little bit in order to help them connect with you can, and um, engage academically as well. So here's one example that I tried recently and I love it so much, I will always do this from now on. I got this strategy from um, Tom Seleska at uh, Concordia University, Wisconsin. He teaches a large enrollment biology class and in his example, he actually has his students do this with three photos, but I simplified it. I did it with one and it is still very powerful. The idea is to get your students to go to their smartphone to the photo library that's already on their phone. No, don't go out and take a new picture. Choose something that's already on your phone. Paste that photo into a Word doc or a Google assignment. It could be any, you know, any format. Write a couple of lines about why you chose to share this photo, what you want me to know about you. And we know that our students, especially if something is a little bit out of the box, we know our students want to see kind of examples or what does this look like? So I picked this photo. This is my family. Um, I have three daughters. It cheers me up that they're all wearing black because I literally wear black every single day. And that day they were all in black. We are at Disneyland in this photo. I'm sitting across from them on the Jungle Cruise. It's my favorite ride. It is so corny. I love it. You know what? We're going next week. My oldest daughter, she's actually in the middle there. So this is, a, you know, from a few years ago. But my oldest daughter in the middle, she turns 18 next week. And for her 18th birthday, she wants to go to Disneyland. So we are going next week. But, I, you know, I just told my students, I wrote a few lines. Like, here's, here's my family. Here's what we like to do when we're having fun. And I was blown away by what they chose to share with me. I never anticipated this. I implemented this um, assignment. It was, an, it was an assignment worth points in the first week of my online class the one that I teach at Estrella Mountain Community College, which is a Hispanic serving school. And most of my students are um, Latinx or black or multiracial, biracial, some format. Um, these students revealed their cultural values to me through what they chose to share with me. I saw pictures of high school graduations, students saying, I'm so proud of this accomplishment and I wanna do it again. I saw pictures of students with the youth that they volunteer with in their local community organizations, the, men the youth that they are mentoring, lots of black and brown kids that they are surrounded by doing good work. I saw pictures of their extended family and they would write, 
my family is everything to me. I could not do this degree without them. I'm the first person in my family to go to college and I don't wanna let them down. They're getting me through this degree. And in one extremely poignant example, I saw a picture of a grandmother on her COVID deathbed with the whole family arranged around the bed. I was like, whoa, look at this, I'm tearing up again because I'm like, wow, you chose to share that with me. I can't believe how much you revealed. Okay, I got a dab, dab, dab. It just, it really helped me to see my students as people, right? And it invited them to share with me something that they wanted me to know. Now that class is small enrollment. I was able to just respond very briefly, a couple of lines. Wow, I can see how important your family is. You can do this. I would write things like that to them in the assignment comments. Um, if you have a larger class like Tom Seleska, he was saying that it takes him a few weeks, but he does. He looks at every submission and he writes a few lines back. And now he knows more about who his students are. He tells them, it's going to take me a few weeks, but I'm going to respond to every one of you. I want to look at these and interact. So talk about connecting. I just love this strategy. I will always um, keep it. And yes, Cindy, I see your comment about way better than the introduce yourself discussion forum. I actually did this as an individual assignment. I'm not sure if my students would have opened up so much if it were a discussion board, but I do think it would be a really interesting, um, another thing that you could do, show us, show the whole class something about yourself. So yeah. And then just, um, yeah, just yesterday, I was in another professional learning context where somebody said, what if my students don't have smartphones? And I, I think that's fairly unlikely today but she was hypothesizing that maybe they could either borrow somebody else's smartphone or maybe go ahead and go and take a picture, uh, possibly even just Google some images. So just kind of alternative ways to think about structuring that assignment to be as inclusive as possible. Yeah, thank you, Karen, for saying thank you. It was powerful. It still, it still gets me. You can see this. Okay, however, let's keep going. Um, and let us think about the value of helping students get to know each other. In order to help them feel like they belong in our classes, a little tiny bit of coaching from us in terms of helping them get to know the people who are around them can be really powerful. So if you do small group work, coach your students to exchange names first before they get going on the task or the assignment. If you do running semester groups, like semester long groups, which there are kind of pros and cons, but it can be a really interesting way to foster these relationships and connections. Encourage your students to exchange phone numbers and reach out. Maybe one of your students misses class. Maybe the other people in their group can text them and say, hey, are you okay? Are you sick? Can I bring you some soup? Like you can do a little bit of this kind of coaching. And what the studies show is that even if students feel connected with at least one other or a small group of people, maybe you teach a large enrollment class, it doesn't have to be you always pouring out to your students. If you help them connect with each other, we experience these same kind of benefits of belongingness, which remember predicts academic achievement, persistence, and success. So again, this is all about coaching for me. Lisa Nunn recommends structuring a way for students to find compatible study partners. Uh, this could be like a, a Google Doc or spreadsheet of some kind, or it could be something that you do on paper if you're in the room. Um, some way of, of asking students, hey, what kind of subjects are you looking for study partners in? What is your availability? Are you available on weekends, evenings, mornings? What's best for you? And then kind of doing a little bit of study matchmaking, right? Study partner matchmaking to help students connect with each other so that they feel like the people in the room are their people. Um, again, we know of some tried and true things like the discussion forums, introduce yourself, but I would encourage us to think about structuring learning relationships as well. And again, maybe doing something that we may not have done before the pandemic in terms of taking a little bit of class time to um, connect students with each other in supportive and even learning focused ways as well. Yes, and Susan, I see what you're saying about um, students uh, texting each other if you know to see. So this the talking point that I'm making here is based on a um, course example, not a course example, a redesign that I did a few years back in a large enrollment 240 cap intro bio class that used to be known as a weed out class. And this is exactly what the instructor did in the redesign is form these semester long groups. And the students told us on their surveys, you know, we, we did a little bit of research on the, on the redesign. They told us at the end of the semester that just knowing that somebody in the class recognized if they were there or not that day, somebody in the class knew their name, made a huge difference to their ability to, and honestly, even their willingness to come to class, right? <laughs> so 
fostering these relationships um, really is important in terms of academic success as well. And then I already kind of previewed this one. Um, in addition to initial connections, good idea to keep these interactions going. I know some of us have started doing things like icebreaker games periodically, or even sometimes in every class period, we do something to help students get to know each other, to help us get to know our students. Um, these are things that we can consider kind of building into our class. And keep in mind, remember I said at the very beginning, what, you know, what might we stop doing in order to make time for some of these things? Some of you are listening to me going, I don't have time to take class time to do that. We got to get through our content. I get it. I understand that. But can you do something like what Cindy did and maybe record a video to deliver some material to explain some things such that you can open up a little bit more bandwidth in your synchronous meeting times or in your asynchronous modules to help students kind of feel more uh, connected and more welcomed as people. Um, last but not least, I would encourage, again, there's like um, lots of things that we can do on this note. Um, but basically even just essentially positive and supportive communication with our students to help them feel that we see them as people um, small talk, chit chat, these kinds of things really make a difference, even academically. Here again, let me check in with you. What has been most interesting? What has gotten your attention? What do you want to think more about? Chat comments, perhaps, or an, a quick unmute? Evelyn, thank you so much for providing links to the books. Appreciate that. What has been most interesting? By the way, frequently checking in with your students is another strategy that many people adopted during the pandemic with Zoom polls as one example. And our students are asking us to keep that practice. Check in with us, see how we're doing. Relaxing and resting. Thank you, Maria and Evelyn. The book in Donald has. Oh, I'm, so, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Donald had a, a great question in the chat, and since it was, and I think it's great because it's my question too. Um, could we talk about that a little bit? How can faculty re-engage students who seem to have checked out due to COVID exhaustion? Yeah, and I would love to hear from others of you. And then Michael, I saw your question. I honestly don't remember what book I mentioned. So if you can pop something in the chat box that about what the book, because I know I just spout off book titles all the time. How can we help students re-engage? Well, I think about this in a couple of different ways and I'd love to hear from others of you as well. I think there's two points, two main points. I really think that transparent messaging and talking to our students about how this has been a tough time, this is exactly why I have my slides about what a tough time this has been. I think talking to them about that and just, hey, this has been really rough and you may have forgotten how to be a student. This is something that I'm hearing from faculty, that they are lacking social skills, that they don't know how to do the work, that they don't seem to be willing to do the work. I would encourage us to talk with our students about that and kind of say, I understand this has been a really crazy, terrible time, unprecedented in any of our lifetimes, but how are we gonna come out of this? And so transparent messaging, but also quite frankly, I think for our own sanity and well-being, my opinion is we may not be able to save all of them. And I know that sounds so awful and I, I hate to even say it, I take it back, retract it. <laughs> but I don't think we can make our students learn. We can't and we need to give ourselves permission to do the best that we can and recognize that these are individuals leading their lives and, and managing the best they can. I read something relatively early on in the pandemic about students not going to class or Zoom class because they were struggling with suicide ideation and they didn't have the capacity to go to class. And that's, that's okay sometimes. Um, you know, let's do what we can, but let's not expect to have miracle results, I would say. So other thoughts on that? I saw a few things come in. I haven't read them yet. Um, the Adam Gray, oh, yeah. Um, email students who fall behind, hoping to motivate them. Uh, yeah, you know, Terrence, here's an idea that you can make this um, strategic. I love, so Terrence's comment in the chat box is about emailing and, and including successful students. 
Here's a um, efficient way to do that because we have to protect our own time and, and uh, boundaries as well. Maybe consider sending an announcement to the entire class saying, hey, everybody, I just wanted to check in. How are you? If you need anything, um, reach out. And that way you kind of get that supportive message going out to everybody. You could add something like you're doing really great work. Um, and then if you need a little support from me, reach out. And then it's going to be a very small subset of students who will do that. So I'm all about efficiency. I love the thumbs up. Thank you, Terrence. But I love that you do that. Something new that I just started doing this semester, right? I talk this stuff all the time. What am I actually walking in my own teaching? For the first time this semester, I noticed if a student, um, and again, I have relatively small classes, so that, that helps. But I have been emailing my students who miss an assignment and I say, hey, are you okay? Need anything? I found out that one person had a knee replacement on the same day as the assignment due date. I literally did say to her, okay, you can have some more time, but maybe next time get that assignment in before the scheduled surgery. <laughs> I had another student who I reached out to and she's like, yeah, I've been really sick. I don't know what it is. It's not COVID. I've tested and I've been out for two weeks. I'm like, okay, that's all right. You're going to get back. So um, think about ways of reaching out to students in ways that we may not have done before. And again, if you can be strategic and efficient with your own time, Canvas has that great tool in the Grade Center where it's message students who you could send a blanket, copy paste. Um, actually, you don't even have to copy and paste because it just goes out to all the students. Message students who have missed an assignment. That would be a way to implement something like this for a larger enrollment class. Um, and so Michael Moore, let me, am I getting your name right? I think it's Michael Moore. Um, oh, Michael Moon, so sorry. Because names are really important. We want to be careful to try to get names right. We really do. Um, it wasn't a book that I mentioned, although I really do like Adam Grant's work and I see the, um, yes, thank you, Susan. That's exactly it. It was an article. There's a specific kind of joy we've been missing. Read it. It's really um, some interesting food for thought. So, okay. Let's come back into the slides because we also want to talk about um, what things we can do that are more academic in nature. But before we do, I will uh, call out Terrence's great recommendation here to record responses to discussions, feedback in the grade book and announcements in Canvas Studio. And again, I'm a big fan of one-to-many communication as opposed to a whole bunch of one-to-one -one communication. So Cindy's example is um, a way of doing that. Recording general feedback to the class. Okay, everybody, here's some good pointers for, you know, on this last assignment, here's some things you did good and here's some things we wanna improve and ask your favorite instructional designer for help. 100%, absolutely. Okay, let's come back in. I don't wanna run out of time. We're gonna talk about how we can promote academic belonging. And again, I am thinking of my friend Alejandro who, who um, received the message that he was not cut out for college. And I don't believe that is true. I believe that he absolutely could have been successful if uh, supported in different kinds of ways. So that's what we're going through here. The first one is about normalizing academic challenge. And this is a lot of the times about the way that we talk to our students. So I'm gonna ask you to notice what you say to your students and then reframe, rethink that phrasing. Here's a common example. I know you did this in high school, but I know this is a review, but, well, do you? Do you know that every person in your class had the opportunity to learn that material when in, you know, in some previous um, class, we know that many schools are underfunded. We know that there are opportunity gaps. We don't know if our students had the opportunity to really master that concept. So instead of saying, I know this is a review, why don't we just change our phrasing to say, you may have already seen this, but just to make sure we're all on the same page, let's just review this material, right? Um, just a different way of kind of talking to our students so that they don't feel dumb if they don't know it, right? Maybe they didn't have that opportunity and now the, the previous way of talking makes people feel dumb, quite frankly, and feel like they, they, they can't cut college. Um, another way to do this is um, just to talk about things like, uh, this is hard, right? Use phrasing like this. This is hard, but I know if you put the work in, you can get this. Uh, it's just about coaching. It's about wording that we use to our students. It's about um, this is going to take effort, but it is worth it because you are capable of doing this work. So thinking about ways of normalizing the academic challenge, um, talking about how it can be challenging for everybody, even yourself. I'm gonna get to that in just a minute. But let's also normalize academic supports. So 
tutoring services, academic success services, um, study groups, uh, your own office hours, or as some people are beginning to call them, student hours, because first generation students may not know what office hours are. We, we Students are telling us that they see office hours and they think, oh, that's the time when you're in your office working, I better not interrupt you. So maybe consider student hours or just explaining if you wanna stick with office hours, talk to your students about what those are. This is kind of what I mean about normalizing yeah, academic yeah. supports. Have your students, um, sorry, I was gonna say, have a representative from the tutoring service come into your class and talk to your students so they won't feel quite so weird walking into the tutoring. I made this point to some faculty in California a few weeks ago and one person there put in the chat box that she tells her students that A students go to tutoring. Students who get A's go to tutoring. This is the kind of normalizing I'm talking about. Maybe schedule your office or student hours right before or right after class so that it's really easy for your students to go. Maybe walk back to your office with you. Um, thank you, Adiola. Really good to see you. Thanks for being here. Um, but just, again, try to make it more normal that it's okay to take advantage of the support structures that are already in place. Again, message or coach to your students that why don't you form a study group? It will really help you in this class. Students who have been successful in this class in the past, um, you know, the ones who did the best, went to tutoring, did study groups, those kind of things. That's what I'm talking about in terms of normalizing the supports. Similarly, we can coach effective learning behaviors. We know that students come to us from high school or if we have returning students not really knowing how to study. And let's think about this just for a minute. In high school, a lot of students don't have to study. They have learned that if they go to class, mostly do the reading and show up for the test, they're gonna be fine. They've learned that but that is not the case in college. And again, I'm not saying that we dumb it down or make it easier. What we do is we help students recognize the work and put in the work that is necessary to be successful. So I was observing a statistics class in the fall and the instructor on the very first day said, um, first she asked about students' level of anxiety with statistics, because that's a well-known thing. And then she said, look, I know this is new for a lot of you. Here's what I recommend you do go ahead and read the chapter before you come to class. Even if it's slow, and even if you don't fully understand everything, try to get through the whole chapter before you come to class. We're gonna talk about the concepts in more depth. And then after class, you'll probably have a better understanding. Go ahead, go back through the chapter and kind of review and make any notes that you need and kind of you know, re-immerse yourself in the chapter again. This is the kind of thing that I'm talking about. It doesn't have to be um, arduous or take up a lot of time, but maybe think about, um, bringing in strategies and talking to your students about those things. There's another wonderful book that I don't have the a slide for <laughs> that I'll recommend. And Evelyn, my good friend Evelyn, may be willing to look it up on Amazon and share a link. Thank you, Karen. I appreciate that. This book is called Teach Your Students How to Learn. The author is Sandra McGuire, M-C-G-U-I-R-E, Teach Your Students How to Learn. Even if you Google that, um, you'll probably find a few of her suggestions. It's about how um, students don't know how to study, basically, and they also don't like the phrase study skills. So she recommends that we don't use that phrase, but just kind of structure things and talk to our students about what they can be doing to support their own learning. And another way of two, well, I would say two more ways of normalizing, um, sorry, extending academic belonging. And after these two, then I'm going to be ready for a few more minutes of question and conversation, just to give you a heads up. By the way, verbal signposting like that is also very helpful for your students. Um, telling them what to expect reduces anxiety and helps them to engage cognitively. So whether you use slides, um, I know one faculty member in business who has an opening slide every day of class. It's a pie chart, and the pie chart shows what percentage of class time will be spent on what different activities, help people know what to expect. They're going to be happier, happy emotions um, precede learning. So that's why I gave you that verbal signpost. Two more things from me, and then I'm happy to hear from you. First one, and uh, we may have talked about some of this before, so this may be a little bit of a review, but just a reminder that it's a good way to extend academic belonging, is that my slides are not cooperating. And this happens when my computer gets tired, so I'm going to pull down the slides come back, sorry, um, and come back into presentation. And what we're gonna talk about now is activities based on learning science because of the fact that 
students necessarily don't know how to use their time on task. We know that spending time on task is a necessary precursor for student success and learning. However, students don't know how to. And even if they do know what they should be doing in terms of effective studying, they're busy people with many competing demands on our time. Today's students are very likely to have one or more of the following kinds of challenges on their time. They work, maybe they work more than one job, they have a child, they might be a single parent, they might be caring for elderly family members. Today's students are juggling all of those things. So even with the best of intentions, they may not actually invest the time that they need to. So this recommendation is about assigning it and making it worth points. Um, that may or may not resonate with your grading philosophy and we can talk about how to reduce your grading burden, but maybe consider assigning activities and tasks that help them spend uh, their time productively instead of reading and rereading and highlighting and reading their highlights, which doesn't work based on what we know about how we learn. So again, this may be a review. I'm not gonna dwell on this, but um, activating prior knowledge helped prime the pump for new learning. So today, when I said to you, how does it feel like when you belong in a group? How does it feel like when you feel like you don't belong? That was me activating your prior knowledge or experience. You can do this conversationally. You can do this in discussion forums. You can do this in small groups. You can do this in terms of an ungraded quiz or a survey. Try to um, critically analyze this piece of text and, and kind of tell me what themes you see in it. Um, ungraded, you know, before you kind of assess their ability, but get people working on things that they already know or talking about things they already know or have experienced really primes the pump for new learning. Partial framework, I'm pretty sure we did some of this before. It's about providing guided notes or partial PowerPoint slides or a concept map that is partial or a diagram that students annotate of a cell and cell processes and structures while you're lecturing, while they're watching your video, while they're doing the reading. Anything partial that students can take notes in helps them organize their learning and remember it more effectively. Structure retrieval practice is about frequent quizzing. There's something called the testing effect that when we test our students, um, it helps them to remember that information better, which is good for long-term learning and memory. Students like, for example, my one daughter who is gonna be 18 next week, she's the nerdiest student you ever met and she loves flashcards. She makes them for herself. She has uh, really accomplished a lot with her flashcards. Not all students are like that. So uh, structure these quizzes. I heard of one great example in the fall where a faculty member has a five point quiz that's due in Canvas by midnight on every day that class meets. So if class meets Monday, Wednesday, Friday, he has a five point quiz that's due by midnight of Monday and Wednesday and Friday. He doesn't care if students contact each other and compare notes and answer. It's, it's still just a way of reviewing the information. So I love that kind of post-class quiz idea as well. And then um, that was not where I wanted to go. I think maybe that is, sorry, I'm, I'm sitting here looking at my notes. See, I have notes, which I'm making a point to share you, I mean, to show you because um, helping our students see that we need our own aids and things um, is another way of helping them to see us as real people. So I thought I had one more recommendation here, but this is the kind of thing where we can uh, create these activities um, that might be worth points. It might be just, um, I heard, this is a fascinating phrase. I heard an uh, expert on game-based learning call this experience points. So maybe you don't wanna be grading all these concept maps or such, but if students turn them in, they get points just for, you know, you can take a quick skim, a quick peek and see if it looks like they made a good faith effort. And then they get experience points, which if I understand correctly in video games, strengthens the character, gives new um, powers or abilities. I don't know, I'm not a gamer, sorry. But right, you get the idea here. So it doesn't have to involve a lot of grading. It can be kind of a, you get credit for doing it kind of activities. Here's my last recommendation, and this is crazy. Hear me out just for a minute. Our students, learn so much when we are willing to be open with them about things that haven't gone well for us and how we bounced back from them. Failure is inevitable, setbacks are inevitable, but what matters is how we come back, how we bounce back, what happened. So selectively, right? You're not gonna tell them everything that's ever gone wrong in your life, but um, with an academic focus perhaps, uh, share some examples of things that haven't gone well for you before. Uh, there's a well-known activity called CV of failure. CV of failure, if you Google that, you'll find some really funny examples. Jobs I did not get, research grants I lost, 
schools that rejected my application. Uh, you know, just some funny things that um, kind of help students see that it's okay if it's not, thank you, Cindy, so much, good to see you. It's okay if it's not perfect in the first place. It doesn't mean they have to drop out of college, right? That we can overcome these things. So love this idea of sharing selected failures to help your students see that um, effort is required, setbacks are okay, we can work through it. And again, I'm just gonna end by reminding us that it really is about the people in our classes. This is how we're going to renew ourselves and refill our teaching cup is by making time to be with our students a little bit more, extend that belongingness, form those connections, experience that collective effervescence. It's gonna re-energize both us and our students. In addition to the messaging that we're gonna to talk to our students about, I know you're tired. These strategies are gonna to help to re-energize your students and get them back in the game. So I always like to end with a thought provoking question. Is there something that we've talked about here today that you wanna start doing, that you're thinking about doing, or is there something you're gonna stop? So something you're gonna to stop to make more time for these things. Uh, you can answer that if you would like to in the chat box or just think about it. We only have about five minutes left, sorry. I, uh, well, we had some good conversation already, but what else? What's on your mind? What questions, thoughts, strategies that are helping you? This is my last visit with UIW. I'm a little sad. <laughs> I really value your time here today. Uh, I, we've lost a few people, but that's okay because time is very precious. And if you're watching this recording later, thank you for persevering to the end. Appreciate it. Thoughts, questions? Maybe our brains are full. Michael says, you stopped staying late to meet with students. You limit meetings to 30 minutes. Um, <laughs> Yes, thank you, Gail. Um, that Michael, you say that you're supposed to have four hours a week and you uh, usually end up meeting with students eight hours a week. You may also, I, I, first of all, I totally value that you're investing your time with your students. And of course, you may think a little bit more about one-to-many communications. Is it possible to maybe record another video or something? You wanna say something? I've learned to watch the Zoom queue of unmuting. Oh. No, it's just um, because we have a lot, we, we, our population is a lot of high risk students. Um, so we do, you know, we have to, we provide a lot of supportive um, coaching basically to help them mm -hmm. be mm -hmm. successful and to retain them in the program. And, you know, we're a nursing program. It's very, very rigorous. And um, so, and a lot of them can do it, but, you know, when I first started, I would spend way a lot of time, like, you know, it's an hour per student, you know, and before you knew it, you had no time to do the rest of the stuff. And, and I really have gotten made a conscious choice of, I'm happy to meet with students, but, you know, it's got to be limited and we can't cover everything. And because, again, nobody likes to say it, but faculty can only do so much. At some point, the student has to do the work. And, and, and learn how to incorporate the suggestions in order to improve um, because we can't change the, we can't change the, um, uh, the standards of practice. You know, we, they, they can't come down. So you either have to come up or you won't be successful. And, and I know that's difficult, but um, that, that's like people's lives depend on it. No, so. You are making a really important point. Thank you for talking to us. Um, you are defining and protecting your boundaries. Well done. And I'm also thinking a little bit about um, a program that I have seen at my local university where um, maybe a lot of students set out to be nurses because they want to help people and maybe nursing really isn't right for them. So this program that I'm thinking of basically was an intervention to uh, work with students on other helping professions. Is there something else that doesn't require so much um, science, for example, so much biology? Um, you know, what else might um, scratch that professional and personal itch in terms of if this doesn't work out for you, maybe we can mentor our students, guide them, maybe as an institution, even we could have a program that sort of says, okay, you, this isn't working out very well for you. <laughs> uh, 
but you're making a good point. You can't lower the standards. Right. And, and I will say one of the things I've never said to a student and I won't say to a student is you should never be a nurse. I, I won't say that. But what I say is if you want to be a nurse, this is what you've got to be able to do. So it's your choice. You're smart enough to be here because you got into the program. So I always acknowledge that. But it's like, but beyond that, you have to you have to figure out how to be successful in the program and we can help you. But it's ultimately up to you. And so um, so, you know, it's trying to be positive, but at the same time, realistic. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love the wording that you're sharing right now. That's a that's a really great way to approach that. Thank you. So I think we're out of time. I really appreciate everybody who was able to make the time to stay until the end here uh, without judging people who needed to go. And uh, I just want to thank you again for having me and for engaging with me and um, wish you all the best. I really, mostly, I wish you a restorative and refreshing and restful summer. Flower, thank you very much. It was a wonderful session. Thank you. Everybody take care. Home. Thank you. <laughs> Bye.